I was raised in the Deep South. I was born in 1951 in Jim Crow, Mississippi, in a little town called Laurel, Mississippi. I was sitting in the backyard when I was six years old. My neighbor was uh, Miss Helen, we'll call her. She was the, the typical kind of Southern older woman who had carte blanche with any white child to train them in how to be a young gentleman. I mean, that was what you needed to be in the South, as a, what it was to be a young gentleman, to be respectful of your elders. So she always taught me the rules about, about when to say Mr., and when to say Mrs., and when to say not to say ain't, and how to keep my, how, how to not to talk with my mouth full, and keep my elbows off the table. And I love this woman very much. So I was sitting in my backyard watching this black man who was working in her backyard raking straw, this elderly black man, I, I don't know, he's probably 70 years old. And as I watched him, I became curious because he was, it was a very hot day in Mississippi summer, probably 80, 90, 100 degrees, I don't know. And he was wearing a, a, um, a long sleeve shirt. And it was curious. You know, why was he wearing something like that on a hot day like that? So I decided I'd go over and ask him. I said, why are you wearing a shirt like that? Aren't you sweating? And he told me, he said, well, he said, um, I wear it because it makes me sweat. And when you sweat like this and a nice uh, breeze comes along, it's like having air conditioning. It keeps you cool. So I thought this was the wisdom of the ages. So we're talking, and Miss Helen, this wonderful, esteemed, cultured white lady comes back and she says, what are y'all talking about? And I, and I wanted to mind my manners. And there's a certain nomenclature in the South, at least when I was being raised, about what you call people what I call adults. If people are like my parents' age, you call them Mr. Johnson or Mrs. Smith. If they get a little older, then you call them Mr. and Mrs., but you use their last, their, their, their first name. It's a form of uh, respect. So Mr. Joe or Mrs. So I had um, I found out his name was Joe. So she said, who are you talking to and what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm just talking to Mr. Joe, wanting to impress Miss Helen. And she looked at me, and she kind of screwed up her face, and she says, oh, no, honey, Joe's not a mister, Joe's a, and then she used the N-word. Now, that was an extremely important moment in my life. And I didn't remember this moment until I was 30, 40 years old, which is true for most of these formative moments. Things, walls have to fall before you can see back into your past and reinterpret it. But I remember that moment. Now, looking back on it, I look at, I knew something important had happened. And I looked at Miss Helen's face, and it was the same Christian, loving face that I'd have remembered. She was a nice woman, and she looked at Joe in a very loving way. And then I looked at Joe to see if anything was the matter, and Joe was just nodding his head and smiling. So in my six-year-old world, I said, oh, this is normal, and whiteness is normal and I don't have to treat this man like a fellow human being. At that moment, Joe no longer became a human being. He became Mrs. Helen's yard man. And his moment of silence bestowed upon me a feeling of superiority. And what I have to, and to understand my own whiteness, what I have to realize is I liked it. It wasn't something that made me embarrassed. It made me comfortable because in that moment, I understood the world. I understood why I drank out of separate water fountains. I understood in that moment why I went to a separate school and why the black schools were falling down and rickety. I understood why I got a nice school bus and I passed the blacks walking on foot to their schools. Everything made sense. I was like, oh, it's different. And what was best, it was okay with everybody. And I became extremely successful. In 1986, I started my own company. Also what was happening, at that same time, I had, came to the, I had come to the pinnacle of the white man's success. I had money, I had prestige, I had power, I had, a, I had a beautiful home, I had big company cars, and I was dying inside. Um, there was something that was broken that I didn't know what it was. So um, what happened was in 1988, I was sitting in front of the TV, and it was a 20th anniversary of the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King. And as TV stations do and newspapers do, they always go back and do some kind of retrospective. So they're showing all of these films of my formative years of Dr. King walking through these small, dusty Mississippi towns. So I watched, 
And for the first time, I looked and studied the people not marching, but the people on the side of the road, the ones throwing the rocks, waving their Confederate flags, shouting their profanities, the rednecks. And then it hit me, and I said, oh my God, those are my people. That's my father, that's my mother, that's me. This is not black history, this is my history. This is what formed who I am. I knew I had to do something, that um, I had to find out who I was. I didn't know exactly how to go about doing that, but I knew the experience that came up immediately was that lawn experience in the South with Joe, and I realized the world happened in that moment and I missed it. And there was something about his silence that I had to find out about. And it's a silence in the invisibility of black people in America today. And how that gives us white people our privilege. It's the silence.